Hello and welcome back to The Note. Let's continue talking about emerging markets today. We've had a lot of headlines about crises in the emerging markets so far this year, and obviously there are a few countries where there are political crises going on. But could it be that ultimately the bigger crisis in the world today concerns the developed world and its debt? Could it also be that we're being far too simplistic when we talk about the full range of emerging market countries as one asset class? That, at least, is the contention of my guest today. He's the head of research at Ashmore Yandeng. Yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Let's start uh, with a classic chart of showing the growing global imbalance. As I understand it, America is borrowing ever more, and that's largely coming from emerging markets who are building up their reserves to accommodate that. How do we get away from these reserves? What does this imply for markets? I think what this implies is that we are in a state of extreme global disequilibrium. Uh, this has three fundamental manifestations. Uh, one manifestation is that we've never printed this much money with so little inflation. Right. The second manifestation is we've never had this much debt with such low real interest rates. Yeah. And the third manifestation is that external stock balances in emerging markets have never been this strong with such weak currencies. These are all expressions of extreme global disequilibrium. Okay, so how do we get back to something like equilibrium from this extreme state? Well, the reason why we have this disequilibrium is because the market forces that would normally cause these things to change have temporarily been reduced significantly because of deleveraging. So the key focus should be when is deleveraging over? Then we will see a resumption of inflation. Then it raises questions about monetary policy and exchange rates start moving. Okay, and I suppose we're primarily talking about household deleveraging in the States, which has carried on very impressively already. How much further do you think it has to go? Well, households have delevered about 75% from about 130% debt to income down to about 100% debt to income. I would contend we need to go back to about 90% debt to income, and we should get there around the middle of 2016. So the current market dynamics stay in force for another couple of years Correct. on your basis. So we have a classic difficult problem judging between the tactical and the strategic on that analysis. Let's take another, a look at uh, another chart which you produced which shows the total debt burden of the emerging markets compared to uh, developed markets. It might surprise a lot of people that there really is no increase in net indebtedness in the, the emerging world. What is happening here? Well, what this shows you is essentially the uh, logical consequence of the end of the Cold War. Uh, after which we saw a material improvement in macroeconomic mm. policies for the simple reason that politicians in emerging markets largely have to account to their domestic populations, and their domestic populations are poor, cannot withstand uh, instability, want growth, and therefore demand stable macro policies. And that's why debt-to-GDP ratios in emerging markets have been declining and are still declining uh, as we go forward. Whereas, of course, in developed economies, we are seeing a significant buildup in debt. And this, by the way, is only government debt. Uh, if you add private sector debt to this, you can add 300% of GDP. Now, a lot of people will think this is a little upside down in the big story of last year was that the Fed started talking about tapering. And the immediate, very dramatic market response was to sell off currencies of a number of current countries that had large current account deficits. People talked about them as the fragile five. Mm -hmm. How do you account for that? This is, this is not the picture that people, most people think we should have of emerging market debt. Well, I don't think there is a single uh, incident in world history where the initial reaction in the markets to a new piece of uncertainty, in this case tapering, has not always been to buy dollars, buy treasuries and sell EM. Right. I don't think you can find a single incident of that. In addition to that, we had well, a... Well, they sold treasuries last year, but carry well, on, yes. Yes, until the Fed was forced to U-turn on tapering right. because what the real, what the market price action showed you last year was essentially that the U.S. economy was so intolerant to higher, um, so unable to tolerate higher real interest rates that the Fed was forced to U-turn on tapering before the policy even began. So, but what has happened to the Fragile Five since then? We've had two separate emerging market sell-offs. For a final question, can you explain to me the difference between those sell-offs and what they mean for the future? Yes. The Fragile Five are, of course, rap rapidly becoming the Frugal Five. Uh, they do not have crises. Uh, they had some macroeconomic adjustment to do. Very basic. Uh, you reduce domestic demand, you devalue your currency, and then you restore external and domestic equilibrium. This is fundamentally different from a crisis. A crisis is when you run out of reserves, right. when your debt becomes unsustainable, when your banking system collapses, or you have wholesale corporate defaults. There's none of that going on in EM. 
we have three EM countries that are permanently surfing on the edge of crisis for domestic political reasons, Argentina, Venezuela and Ukraine, uh, but that has nothing to do with tapering. Okay, Jan, thank you very much indeed. That was an alternative view and an uncomfortable view, but it's hard to argue with a lot of it. The greatest problem for investors is that even on Mr. Dane's view, obviously these trends could carry on for a year or two more before we start getting a very dramatic reversal.